in dance even before she joined social media she found expression in dance oh. so what does dance do to a disabled body i mean she cannot continuously uh, do it but she it's her passion she just loves dancing oh. and people say i mean not others say that she's a good dancer and she That's conceptualizes excellent. and learns very quickly That's excellent then let's pause let let let's let him come inside and then let's pause there are fair various things that we have to catch ourselves right uh, you you were compa- you were you were kind of um, uh, can you guys hear me you can hear me now right you 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 yourself in the characterization othered her dance right and you, you yourself in her in the characterization evaluated her dance in relation to a particular form of mainstreamness yet what we know is that she is dancing so this is this adds to your in very interesting theory building happening through your interviews in regard uh, to the digital. ma'am but it, it didn't come to the interview i know it because she's a friend you might take it there right okay yeah that's fine it doesn't have to the interview is for this moment in this class but if you know this about her because you have a very interesting juxtaposition and parallel of here's a disabled body expressing herself through dance where um and and, and again being um kind of compared to a so called normalcy and then the same disabled body then has successfully reached out to a network of people through the digital right so that corporeality moves in different ways but also is 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 actually resisting disciplining uh, it's it's pushing this body i'm sorry to call it a dead but she is pushing against these external controls of her body right through the both corporeality and subjectivity which are her body right so that's the richness of being able to go to go out of these traditional boxes we are given about what is research right so you will re- re- revisit all the things you were saying and see the problematics of your original questioning through these fantastic and again feel free to raise your hands and interrupt because this is going to be richer that way so in in terms of the use of i poems and to better understand complex subjectivities right so we talked about autoethnography in to, in writing autoethnography we sometimes do get into writing in small phrases sometimes you can't articulate can you hear me uh you can't articulate the whole but you know what you're saying it's a, it's an instinctive intuition so you have a um actually a a phrase a word suspended somewhere in between other things that says far more than your detailed explanation yes i mean in your larger writing you might have to ref- kind of elaborate and do your literary review and all the other stuff but the thing is this particular form of expression that you include in your larger writing will speak to the reader there will be another core site of co-produced meaning and if that reader shares the expect uh, shares the experience in through her or his location you have then um the poem allowing uh participants as beings with complex subjectivities right in both the readers and and that's the case even with different other forms of expression so for me where did the spindle take me? getting back to the spindle it took me to think again of women's productive labor i think i mentioned this um in the beginning when i said there was this struggle ah getting that there was this struggle along uh, negotiating marx's binary of productive versus reproductive where reproductive is about the reproduction of the 
labor force in the home space. And most of what we do in the home space is kind of invisible in those. It's implied, but invisible. And we've had feminists such as Silvia Federici uh, and Leopoldina Fortunati and others who have written about how um, Leopoldina Fortunati, for instance, talks about the secret workshop uh, that produces, that reproduces labor, right? So it makes you think about, yes, all that is going on, reproductive um, work in the home space is going on, but this is productive work. Even in that, even without problematizing that binary, Spinning yarn is productive. Um, if you want khadi nowadays, you have to teach people to spin yarn. We, 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 we've ma maintained, we kept khadi alive in India because of the nationalist implications. Whereas in other parts of the world, hand spinning is very hard to sustain. Go back. Uh, so um, yeah, we'll go back. You're getting a, like a preview. So in that sense, the value of women's productive work through domestic space, right? Um, so when I, went, when I was in Sumba, and we were talking about the stereotypical roles that men and women took in production of different parts of the textile that, uh, that would be sold, um, a lot of the discourse was spinning is something that women do because they are more patience. And part of it is also, yeah, and it's also something, and there's, there are other re others who are practitioner researchers, such as a very well-known DIY um, spinning star in Ohio, Abby Frankamont, if you're there listening, <laughs> um, who, who has come from a background of um, being a child of anthropologists. And she speaks about her learning through watching spinners in different parts of the world, right? So the point is you have different uh, narratives around when, uh, when and how spinning continues or when and how it's been revived because hand spinning was interrupted by industrialization, by the mechanization of spinning. Which, of course, you know, if you're getting thread faster, you get cloth faster. And so um, that, that shifted the way in which women and men worked to produce this particular product of yarn. So in, then what happens when you follow the spindle? That question that I asked the first lecture, I think, Reemerges. This has become so fairly in the background, invisible in terms of history. When people write histories of labor, not only are histories of gendered, raced, and other labors, labor uh, histories few, if they exist, there's very few references to spinning as a form of labor. And you kind of think, how could that be? <laughs> it's so crucial, right? Um, and so you, kind of, you, 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 you find yourself going through archives, um, secondary research. You look and you look. There are maybe all of five books that reference the, the con conditions under which women used to spin in any particular social Geo geographical location. Um, one of the co contexts of spinning then takes us back to the cotton manufacturing and uh, in uh, the US. Uh, the cotton industry uh, history is, is, um, is, has a history of slavery. And um, so when contemporary spinners such as myself talk about how calming it is, 
how liberating it is, how wonderful it is. And you start looking for the aspect historically, and you want to narrate spinning as this lovely thing. You have to think about the fact that spinning yarn happened under particular conditions. So even when you had machine-produced thread and yarn for, for much of the population, for instance, African-American slave women were hand-spinning coarse yarn for clothes for their fellow um, um, groups of men and women. Um, this was under supervision, most often of the female slave owner's wife. So the, just because you're a woman, you're out, so not outside of these management structures, right? So this, inserting these, coming, coming aware of these histories then inserts questions about the happy, happy kind of stories we tell about. Oh, let's go back to wearing handloom. Let's go back to all this wonderful activity. And so you think about that. So where is the body? Which body? What does it do? And why? We we'll go back to issues of work and supervision. And part of me wonders, as designers become our prominent mode of engaging handcraft, uh, where, whether, once again, we are reproducing another form of sweatshops with weavers and spinners. And that's a question I'll leave out there, um, and we think we can think about it. And we can take it up again on Monday and um, as we have our guests and others. Following the spindle took me to various other relational networks, right? So you have the spindle I got from Norway. I went, took lessons, spinning lessons in Norway. Then you have me going to Sumba, Indonesia, and meeting uh, spinners there. Um, and of course, you have the hashtag communities, uh, spinners of Instagram. So geolocated histories of spinning. They happen along the spectrum of colonial, post-colonial, and neo-colonial labor shifts. Can be, and I mentioned that they can be mapped through a review of archives and secondary sources, right? So that's actually a, a little clip from a description of how um, England kind of made hand spinning taboo in its colonies. So once again, going back to Sumba then, commodification of, of handmade again. In places where they, they do do handmade, what might that do when this is market oriented, right? So these hand spun pieces are increasingly rare in reality, but there is this perception, and I think someone mentioned this here, here as well, that somehow these subaltern bodies will cater to our desire to go back aesthetically and in time, and recover our culture, right? So, but, but the, the time it takes to get a full product out of hand spinning to weaving um, is often, um, and to get it really well hand spun, is difficult, right? So, yeah. So then this takes me to this talk about my journey to Sumba. And thinking in terms of how, you know, when I asked to speak to spinners, there were a few handful of spinners put in front of me. And so, of course, she's a spinner, I'm a spinner. But who's going to believe I'm a spinner, right? <laughs> so then you have the issue of uh, the interaction that happens on places like Instagram, where the NGO uh, worker who is working with Khadi then is super excited to see cotton spinning and needs all kinds of information and is talking about a paradigm shift, I still have to figure out what that would 
look like theoretically. And as I mentioned, there are further interviews to do, right? So in this subalternity, self-commodified or other commodified, um, is she sitting there tongue in cheek as I take, as I get that picture taken, you know? So, and what is her level of her expertise? We assume that she has better expertise than me because of where she is located. Um, so we wonder. So, you know, she handed me these, I still have them. So that then led to a personal journey of uh, on my Instagram expression in terms of hashtag threads of life, where I said, okay, what am I going to do with this? And by the time I had come back from Sumba, it was getting to be the one year anniversary of my mother's passing away. So what I did then was I said, let me try connecting this to thread that my mother had spun. And, you know, so performatively, this, this began to speak on its own. Um, and so here you go, connected the, her, it was already on the cherka, and it was on that particular little spool. And so I was like, and the, the interesting part was, I was having a conversation with my mother, because she, she too had been in Indonesia, but she's not been here. So telling her this story, right? This is where its subjective experience then feeds into trying to think across time, across uh, whatever else. And then I went and looked. Uh, I found my old, 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 when I was three years old, I suppose because that was our first trip outside of India. Uh, and uh, then British Airways was BOAC. So I'm assuming this little thing was something I had from then. It could or it could not be. Who will tell me the story of this? My mother, who can no longer tell the story or work. Um, it's, it's, uh, we, we know that now there's an increasing move towards making. And I put an article by Padmini Remuri that puts this into question as when you are in uh, urban spaces and, and global north, other spaces, making brings, or, or you're a digital worker, making does certain, is, is a balance. Whereas in a place like India or other developing world countries where making is also about, as I said, uh, reaching the market through handcrafted goods that have to be, you know, um, and also about livelihood, it puts a different kind of a uh, meaning to it, right? So, but there is this huge move amongst mostly young people and mostly techie people for maker spaces, making uh, of different kinds. And tech industries have taken this up for try, in a way to try to get innovation, right? So if you put bunches of circuits around and you get your employees to have time to explore, then there'll be new innovations perhaps. So, but if you're thinking of this feminist making, a lot of us reassert the idea that we make different forms and that, that produces different forms of pushback against the overall alienation of uh, our everyday existence. One, two, whichever. Yeah, yeah. so uh, maybe I might be taking this dialogue to a different direction. But Go ahead. Um, does it has anything to do with that your mother used to uh, spin and? Um, I think so, yeah. But if it was just that, yeah. I wouldn't have begun as late as I did. Exactly, right. Since you were talking about poetics and, uh, and everything, so I was just wondering, do you, do you also use the concept of techne? Techne? Yeah. Yeah, in what way? Uh, in the sense that techne is also about doing and theory building. Yes, yes. So I was just wondering if you, if you borrow from that as well. Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, I think when I do my workshops, this is part of what I did here, is what ideally what I would do in a workshop is bring which I didn't bring them, bring all 12 of my spindles, you would all be trying to make yarn. And then we would explore 
the technique in different ways, right? And so, for instance, in the workshop I did in Toronto, um, I had a young man who was examining the spinning, and I said, did you observe that it's not, you're not making it happen all the way? Right? And he said, oh, the te technology, right? So we somehow assume that this technology does things that we aren't doing, but if it's a spindle or some other thing, it may or may not be the similar kind of technology molding it differently. So we have different kinds of spindles that we use for different weighted yarn, right? Lace weighted, and so that matters. The technology matters. And so, yeah, the concept of techni, and yeah. And then I think back there, after you. Uh, Ma'am, I uh, missed the first 15 minutes of the presentation, so I'm sorry if it has already been answered. But Don't I was uh, so uh, I was wondering in your research of the, the interviews that you took, did you also take up the issue of spinning as livelihood? Um, I did sort of because for uh, but but spinning as livelihood is more a question that comes up in the global south. I found so uh, when we kind of think about spinning as livelihood, it is in the entrepreneurial framework, crafting as livelihood. Because several of the young women that I interviewed were also attempting to, uh, to set up their alternative entrepreneurial spaces. As we know from literature, it is when there is a downturn in the economy that people try to set up, make entrepreneurial ventures from what? Various kinds of things. Uh, actually, when I asked this question, I had in mind the caste-based labor in India, because yes. spinning is a caste-based occupation in India. Yes. So yes. they have no option. It's not a luxury for them. They have no option but to do it. And uh, when I asked this, I, actually, I was remembering my sister is a textile designer. So uh, in the last two years, she had been working with the hand stitchers of Bengal, the Katha stitch tradition. So she used to buy them the material, all the material, and they used to stitch them and they used to take the labor charge. And because it is actually hand stitched, it's very costly. But uh, she was using it as an enterprise because she got, got them done at a very, not, not very low rate, but the rate quoted by them. But then when she sold the sari, because it is a hand stitched sari, it fetched, it had a high market value. So then it, the, this came into my mind that these people, what are they actually getting? And my sister, how much she is able to sell it for? Yes. So, so it's not so much about the interviews I did with the, with the DIY spinners in the global north. And as I mentioned, uh, the designers then benefit. And you'll hear more about this on Monday as well. Uh, the process is made invisible, even though we have... Uh, okay. The process is made invisible, even though nowadays we have um, many NGOs trying to make it visible. And so what we have here is the potential for these handcrafting um, um, labor activities to be turned into sweatshop work. But we also know that nowadays, people are aware of the political incorrectness of having sweatshops. So they will try to say things like, no, we're actually trying to empower these women. So the key there is when you're, when you're talking to NGO workers or designers, is what differentiates those groups of people or those individuals actually working to empower or working to provide livelihood versus the, the people who are tempted to become the stars, the star designers. Right? That's the key still. And those kinds of questions I have asked previously also of the NGO workers. 
you should feel free to ask more on Monday as more of this comes up. Um, so that's a very important question that actually comes up in juxtaposition, right, in the encounter of these two modes of spinning that we speak. That's where, in response to Sapna, when I said, think that the, a significant finding is how agency is asserted. Under what conditions is agency asserted? Right? And then when I talk about my work on digital subaltern and uh, the connection between these, the affective networks and circuits that are formed between women, these kinds of women in the global north and the women who are produced in microfinance online websites as the people who are self-made entrepreneurs who will be doing whatever craft and otherwise, there's an interesting kind of visual level playing field produced in the techno-mediated space. To make it seem to the person who is a potential lender that you and this person can hold hands and you can connect. However, this very differential, who controls the body? That's why I took you back to the African-American history. Right, and, and on Monday, I'll have another visual of a children's book where the image of um, a particular African-American woman spinning is made to seem it's like a happy activity. And historically, it wasn't, right? So just because it's handmade, we can't romanticize and say, whoever does it, it's lovely. Um, I think she had a hand up, and after her, we have... Did you have a hand up, too? So we have two others, yeah, after her. Yeah, hello. Uh, so my question is, um, methodologically, or while conducting or writing uh, this kind of piece, uh, so how do you differentiate yourself as a weaver who is also a scholar, and uh, the person whom you have uh, interviewed? Like maybe for them it is a livelihood or it is an activity which they uh, try, they, they do to keep themselves calm. So while writing or conducting research, how do you position yourself? Like with any other research, again, we are not, we are, this is not a level playing field. It's all very well for me to acquire a loom and try to play with it, but not have to do it for my livelihood. It's not the same thing. So I make it quite clear. What I do understand is perhaps a certain uh, <clears throat> skill needed for certain things because of learning to weave and spin. But that doesn't make me the expert like they are. That doesn't make me tied to that work as when it's your livelihood. And that's what, in the same way as I was talking about autoethnography, can be re reduced to this happy space of talking about yourself and then qualifying it and then moving on. Likewise, this kind of work could be reduced to, oh, me and the weaver, we walk hand in hand. That's why I showed you the picture. The juxtaposition, you could clearly see when you say, we're both weave spinners. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, Shobha and you had a question. So. And then we'll get to the next one. Actually, in connection to what she just said, uh, I'm just trying to articulate what I uh, want to, but I'm not sure if it will come out clearly. Uh, so uh, when you're talking about spinning, it makes me uh, think of uh, weaving and knitting and other activities uh, which have traditionally, at least in the Indian society, uh, been associated with women's work. Uh, not weaving, not in Indian society. Uh, no, no, I'm saying, yeah, not weaving, but at least things like knitting and embroidery and, you know, things like that. That's what I said, it made me think on those lines. Uh, I know uh, while it's considered as a women's activity, there is also a lot of, there is a level of imposition as well of uh, a woman having to know uh, these qualities 
uh, to be the to be considered as a uh, uh, no no to be considered uh, to be considered as not just appropriately feminine but also you know as the right daughter-in-law you know these Absolutely. qualities Build your trousseau. yeah so uh, I know many of them who have resisted this imposition and uh, and and that's why happily opted for uh, machine made goods and and things like that I, at some level the skills have then you know uh, the pass the passing of skills that usually happens from say a grandmother to the daughter to the daughter that has kind of gone down uh, I say this purely because I feel I have no empirical evidence. Uh, so when you are talking about this, uh, what does this imply when, when, when we are talking about, say, when we are talking about spinning as an activity, when it suddenly gains uh, visibility? Uh, visibility and it suddenly becomes fashionable, something which has gone out of fashion maybe in a particular section of society because of the imposition and other aspects related to it and when that starts getting displayed on these digital spaces uh, what are we actually what is actually happening i mean i'm trying to think myself sure, sure, not is, getting an answer which is the whole reason the curiosity got gotten into this research right okay. my generation was the generation who said screw you i'm not doing it I mean, the, the convent school, we had to do stitch samples, right? Yeah. Home economics. Yes. We were a mess at it because we didn't want to do it, right? So, and then the other issue, so these are, these are then, then somebody like me comes back and sees uh, 20 plus young women returning to this in a certain way. And you're kind of wondering, what's going on here? Why do, and so, the resistance of a, from a particular body of interviews was this is not domesticity. We're doing this as a resistance. But you're right. I still see this as visually reproducing a particular kind of form. And then again, going back to juxtaposing, juxtaposing it with different hierarchies of caste and class and global south versus global north, it's still problematic, right? So that, so in my research, I wouldn't generalize. I would say what's going on here is a result of particular conditions. And what's going on here is a result of particular unique conditions. So just to, again, then how do you see yourself? What is your, like, Me? are you, in the sense when you're writing this, when you're thinking about this, this, this question that I just said, what would be your position? Are you thinking from the space of, say, maybe someone who is an Indian who has seen this, or right now as an Indian American I, who I, is experiencing this? I'd say I this? don't have to have one position. Okay. Because I belong in both spaces. Right. So when I come to India and I do buy things from uh, the hand, handmade places, or I shop, I, I am aware of the interesting unequal dynamics, right? And the increasing trend just in the 10, 15 years since of a designer handmade, hand, handmade products, right? So in that sense, you don't have just one position on this because this isn't about having a moral judgment on the people you're interviewing. It's not about making a value judgment about the young woman, perhaps in Northwest Ohio, who uses knitting to, as a mode of resistance for certain other things, versus the, the exploitation or the sweatshopization of handcrafting that might happen. These are not mutually exclusive. But they're also necessary. You don't have to write about them. You have a position towards them that's the same, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to erase this woman to make that issue up, appear. But where does this erasure occur? And that's what I'll bring up tomorrow in talking about the microfinance portals. Because there is this perception that there is this happy space of connectivity possible between and the racial of hierarchy is possible when somebody is, shares these. That is impossible. So where I come, where I, what I'm seeing through this diverse 
kinds of interviews and kinds of ethnographic work I'm doing is the disjunctures. The disjunctures are becoming very visible to me. But the attempts at making those disjunctures invisible through a production of what I will call happy objects, it allows me to see this. And those are statements I will put forth because this is what we are, what, what, what is happening in the phenomenon, phenomenon of philanthropy 2.0. This, you, you know, this generation of young people who, who are being invoked into philanthropy, and yet these become um, philanthro tourism, philanthro something else. So it, the NGI, for me, this is all. This all leads me to insights of how NGOization and ITization intersect in certain ways. Um, did anybody else have a question? Because after her, then Dami. I know it's probably a follow-up, but let me finish it. Yeah. Uh, this has to do with what uh, Shamika asked and how you responded to her, and also a slide that you showed which uh, uh, stated that uh, Spinner questions ethnographer, ethnographer becomes spinner, spinner possesses ethnographer, which I found a little problematic, the terms. I thought there was an easy conflation of the ethnographer becoming the spinner. And uh, I, you know, because uh, from that slide and from the, that framing, I thought it, you know, segued into each other a bit too easily without, you know, an, uh, without a critical thing. So I just Which want connects to back to Shobha's question. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the assumptions your question or Shobha's question mean, makes is that there is only one form of spinner. Doesn't, just because the ethnographer becomes a spinner doesn't mean the ethnographer be has become that particular spinner, right? There isn't only one spinner. So here we are, what we are facing is, is what your view, what your imagination or your con current image of a spinner is. You are still looking at a particular caste-based brown body in a rural setting as a spinner. So what, and again, the text of the, uh, of the poetry, perhaps I'd go and write another one, right, in response to all the discussion. What this, what this would do is disrupt the idea that that is a spinner. So are we making a moral if a moral statement about what it means to be a spinner, can the authentic spinner only be the disempowered um, or um, caste-based spinner, right? So, can, so that's the whole point of it. So if the ethnographer becomes spinner, it's not in the exact same way. The ethnographer did become a spinner, right? And the spinner did possess the ethnographer, but it can never be in the very same way. Which is why autoethnography is problematic if we don't make those breaks, right? You can't say, I walked into a village and then I suddenly felt like, a, like this person. Which is what some ethnography, autoethnographies get reduced to. So that's, that's why I love the questions, because you are seeing the problems. And so I'm pointing to you is, you, I, when, by saying that ethnographer becomes spinner, I'm by no means saying that I became that spinner. I am a spinner, but am I that spinner? So. Uh, no, I didn't exactly mean, I, I understand what you, where you're coming from. I didn't exactly mean that you were saying that you became that spinner. I just found that a bit problematic. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the connection, connection, uh, connection, concern, empathy, mutuality, affect, whatever you want to call it. So, absolutely, uh, yeah. and hold and, on to yeah, that. Yeah. Hold on to the problematics. Because the next stage of that is coming when I start to talk about the digital subaltern. Because that's exactly where that, that, in, that connection is being commodified and materialized in capital, in, in capital spaces, right? So hold on to that, because we what you just articulated is exactly where it's going to eventually go to. And it's highly problematic to say that. So, agreed, yeah. Uh, 
as I understand it, you began uh, talking about spinning by positioning it within uh, uh, the, the construct of digital domesticity. And a lot of the people you spoke to refused to identify it or identify their activity as domestic. So uh, methodologically then, especially when you're building theory, how do you negotiate with that particular dialectic, that slippage? That's one question. And uh, the other is, uh, how do you see spinning uh, as an activity connect with the digital? Uh, primarily because like, what you were doing with uh, the, what you showed us was basically uh, performativity, right? Like you were oh, performing absolutely. on a digital platform. So uh, I just wondered if uh, that's, that, that sort of thread, all puns intended, ha -ha, uh, is something that you also picked up while you were, because the way that uh, someone, the, the way that a person uh, from the developed world spinning would perform on digital media, perform their spinning on digital media would be vastly different, I, I'm presuming so, too. Yeah, um, yes. Going back to the first question, can you remind me what that was? I was like nodding away, but I forgot. Sorry. The first question was about how you negotiated with, you know, placing uh, yeah. the activity within. Okay. Yeah. So, and this is important for those, everyone, in that you have literature review telling you that this is, ha this is what that is. So you have this literature review telling you that this return to foodism and uh, return to slow cooking, return to knitting and all that is digital domesticity when they start to blog about it, right? So digital domesticity is a term that you kind of go compelled because of the literature. But does that mean that in your actual writing you don't problematize it? You do. So like, again, like all the labels that come up on a presentation, this too, in the writing, will be talked about. But does that make it not digital domesticity? You would say that um, the women don't see themselves as domesticated. That doesn't mean that this is not domesticity of a different sort. They, they resist, they are reacting to the idea that they're domesticated, and this is where I had lots of discussions with Lily Marsh, right? So this domesticity is how they perceive it when we talk about, when I ask them, do you think you're, you're going back to domesticity? They're not going back, but this is a different form of domesticity. But is it the kind of domesticity, for instance, that Emily Macha writes about? Maybe, maybe not. They, each of these are so specific, and so, in qualitative methods, we pay careful attention to each context and each theme, right? But in general, the, because we have this term as a useful buzzword, as a key term, we tend to use it. But we need to unpack it repeatedly in the writing. The next question was? The next question, actually, in relation with this, uh, I feel like how do you then negotiate with the slippage? Because uh, I think uh, if we are going out and conducting a feminist research, for instance, I go out to a woman who has a different viewing practice, say, and I say, hey, that's feminist, man. Like, what I study, it corroborates with that. And she says, don't call me a feminist. I'm not a feminist. Yes, so, have correct. To for that. Right. So, uh, my question is, how, do you, how did you negotiate with the slippage? That's oh, you mean the slippage between calling it digital domesticity and them not wanting it to be domesticity. Well, there's enough co uh, differences in the way it's talked about, right? So again, I probably wouldn't directly call all of them, as, uh, all of it as digital domesticity. The term used perhaps would be in the title, and then I'd proceed to talk about it. But I think one of the things that your next question actually was bringing forth in response was about how do I kind of performatively deal with it. And that kind of, rem that kind of brought to mind the fact that there are varying levels of skills in this discursive digital space, right? And there are such debates over the minute uh, 
the details of the skills. There are huge debates, what it means to do this, whether you should draft before you uh, twist, whether you should twist while you know, drafting. Um, you know, all kinds of very, very minute discussions around the skill, and also how you know, those images don't necessarily reveal everything. That image looks like I'm a great spinner, but I may not be. So you, you are, in that sense, negotiating in a space of, of, of staging a, a, a materiality, right? It's a digital material space that includes the staging of a skill, right? Not every one of us. So when I get, get a picture of something that's on my loom, it looks really beautiful, but don't want to go look at it on the loom, right? <laughs> so there is, there, are, there is definitely that play, I'm sure, that a lot of people go through. Uh, this actually ties into the second question that I'd asked, which was that, you know, how then would you emplace spinning within the digital? Like, how would I place spinning yeah. within the digital? Yeah. Well, they've already placed it, right? Right. So I'm saying, how would you theorize about it? Because I'm trying to... How would I it. theorize it? Yeah. Well, I would theorize it as this phenomenon that's mm -hmm. being globalized. And it would, for me, it would always be pro problematized in relation to the livelihood issue, in relation to the issue of, of uh, caste, and, the in, in, in specifically in India, but also of gender and other things. So it is, it, it, uh, because when you talk about craft, handcraft in particular areas of the global south, it is very closely tied to markets. So for me, those two cannot be separated, which is one of the reasons that I found it very hard to make this into one kind of book. I have to write them in separating things, right? So it, it comes up in different ways, what I get as theoretical frames in different, and you'll see some of this again, uh, the point that you raised about conflating the ethnographer and the spinner, which were, by the way, was very uncomfortably written by me. No, no, but that doesn't, that's not to kind of make me feel good or anything. I'm just saying that's important. So uh, in the sense that when we look at, um, and this is actually a chapter in my online philanthropy book that came out last year, where we talked about affective networks um, and in a space of micro, online microfinance and, and the equalizing of, the, of this, these two categories. So I've really found it hard to just sit down and call it, um, look at all these wonderful you know, DIY spinners and then write about that data that I have and write them in themes because there's all this other stuff. Um, I think uh, you have addressed uh, the point that I was I wanted to ask you, but I would still want to put the question. Uh, you talked about um, ethnographer and spinner, and uh, uh, the problem, the problem, problematic of ethnographer and spinner, and of course the staging of spinning in itself. I was wondering, has there ever been fear of co-option, or uh, has has the question of co-option ever come up? Like co-option of what? Co-option of spinning in itself. Like, I mean, we talked about it. I mean, people have talked yeah, about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the fear is always there. But yeah. I, I want to know what, you, is there co-option of spinning in what sense? Co uh, in itself, this, the skill in itself, the question of, I mean, livelihood, we talked about it. But... Uh, it's happening, right? Yeah. It's happening because... But I mean, what, what goes for me is the point that, I mean, Instagram, for instance, something like Instagram where you can put up a picture of uh, spool and, and spinning. And, uh, but I mean, is it really... Are you really, I mean, is there honesty in portraying of the skill in itself? I mean, who is somebody who is sincerely doing it and somebody who's just putting it for photo? Yes, and that's what, I, that's what I think I was responding to earlier as well, is that there's no guarantee that all of us have real skill in that sense. Um, I'm sure my mother could examine my spinning and tell you that I'm more of a showboat than I am. But I want you to particularly look at what... <clears throat> The NGO worker here asks me, um, he, he asked me about this particular way of spinning. And then I kind of, my response is, the spinning is very, was very scarce in Sumba. Uh, you can't read it, so I'll read it. Hardly any of the next generation was doing it for actual weaving output. 
And unlike us leisure spinners, that would be you know, the, the phenomenon of, in quotes, digital domesticity, they do not have the time to put their craft to use outside of the marketplace logic. This is where the capital kind of defines whether they spin or not, right? So the interesting comment that I'm still trying to put into context uh, as I move on is the response from the NGO worker is a little too happy for me. I know this is getting recorded, and if he sees it, I'll ask him. Um, when we look at spinning as just production, then it might be true. However, how else would we look at it when we're talking about livelihoods, right? So that's my question. Maybe I'm missing something in the answer, right? So this person says, but I can see many individuals getting into the activity in the coming years. And a part of me who's very basic and functional says, I see no point. Why spin? I see no point. Right? That's what people who kind of look at hand spun yarn is like, why? Why are you spinning? You know, the machine can do it. Right? That's the basic question. So if you are of the particular category of people who need to make this a livelihood, why bother spinning? And that became altogether very clear for me on my trip to Sumba in Indonesia. Right? Where, where the older ladies showed me they were spinning. But to produce a you know, woven product out of hand spun takes them close to two years. Why would you bother? Because that doesn't pay your bills. So how else would you look at it if you were them? Because you wouldn't have the time to spin for spinning the sales, which, which addresses all the other questions the others have also raised, right? So that's, hope that helped. And putting that out there gave me a data point, right? It's just same in terms of researching. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, ma'am, I want to just, I'm just curious about the, the Sumba community, that uh, what are the demo, demographics of that, and uh, how big is that community, how it is thriving, and uh, what are the future generations of it, the children of these uh, viewers, uh, what are their options? Have you just uh, delved into that? Or? I just did one trip, and yeah. I would recommend you read Jill Forshee's work on weaving um, the fold or something like that. I'll, I'll give you the thing, give you the book name. Okay. Where she's done an ethnography of the Sumanese weavers. Um, I went there with collaborators from Indonesia, from Samarang, um, and uh, the primary researcher is from Indonesia. So I'm waiting for her to write some stuff up that I can share with you. So she has more information on the demographics um, right now, I refer to this in a purely sort of personal journey way, and out, uh, to a certain extent, a certain autoethnographic way as a spinner. So those other stuff, I can give you the information and other things later. Yeah. Thank you. Still have time. Where are the tough questions? Yes, there she comes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is just something that came into my popped into my head when uh, she was questioning you. Uh, on Instagram, uh, this is just something from my own experience. I'm sure a lot of other people in this room may have experienced it too. Uh, people put up pictures, you know, uh, of uh, of communities. I, I myself uh, should plead guilty to it too. 
uh, of communities. I don't know whether they ask them for their consent. I, I uh, so, you know, uh, by communities, I mean, uh, you know, maybe it's a chaiwala vendor, it's a, uh, f uh, it's a pani puri vendor, or maybe somebody spinning, as, as you said. Or um, a few days ago, uh, a couple days ago, I put up a picture of a lady with her uh, in the fish market in Kharki, but I asked her, can I, take a, uh, can I take your picture? Not that I'm saying that that makes me, I mean, Better. that says nothing. It's still that, circulating yeah, yeah. in the same yeah. ethos. Right? I, I actually want to take a picture of all the fish, you know, for my uh, people on my Instagram feedback in Calcutta, where, you know, Bengalis uh, love eating fish. So I'm just saying that all of this, I would like your comments. You know, this adds to this, gets them social media traction. Yes. You know, you, you yes. put up pictures of these kinds of people. We talked about and, but, I, I know when I'm saying these kinds, or I'm, yeah, I'm not categorizing it. It's just yeah, I can't it. find a kind of uh, access, any critical vocabulary in my mind right now. Uh, you know, w w what would you say about that? Because, you know, they think that it's, a, you know, this entire problematics about India being d diverse. Like, diversity is very problematic. What, what do you mean by diverse? You know, the, the way it's been co-opted by the, by the North, by the global North, by the Western world, by the white-speaking, uh, white Western world. You know, India is diverse, diversity in India, that kind of thing. They think that their social Instagram feed is uh, very diverse if they put up pictures like th this, as opposed to maybe going to a restaurant and putting up pictures of meals or maybe the artwork or stuff like that. So feeds into their social that media That feeds traction. into the poverty tourism, right? Yeah, yeah. Poverty sells. Poverty is a big market in the visual space, and we'll be talking more about that tomorrow. So I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. And I also told you, I think, yesterday that I was walking by, and the street cleaner, she almost thought I was going to take a picture of her, but I wasn't. So I can remember how she looks. I don't need a picture of her, but you know. Whereas in the case of Hana and me, we did it strategically. It, it was a moment of you know, we did it together. Yeah, you need the mic. I was uh, wondering about the location of other spinners in the US. Yeah. And uh, for, uh, for the Indian context, um, we see that a lot of um, upper class, maybe upper caste women taking an interest in yes. uh, Embroidery, they won't uh, stitch themselves, but uh, they do delegate the work. I heard that. Yeah, and then they send it to um, women in the US because, you know, it's cheaper. Yes, it I is heard cheaper. This. And then yeah. they say they made it. Yeah, so it's, hand <laughs> so it's handmade. <laughs> of course, it's handmade, but they're not doing the labor. So they employ uh, somebody who's going to do it for them. Only in India, right? Yeah. Cultures of servitude. Yeah. That's yeah. where the cultures are servitude. But, um, the demographic in the U.S., there might be middle-class women. Again, as I said, the downturn of the economy, a lot of people who, quote-unquote, choose to be stay-at-home moms, but it's usually because it costs more to, you know, have childcare. You know, and there are different reasons, complex reasons. It's not a generalizable one reason. So, but the interesting thing about what you just said is, on a place like Etsy, there used to be strong rules about what you could sell. You have to make it yourself. You can't sell other people's handmade goods. And then there's this huge debate of when Etsy opened up in a, um, and got their uh, IPO or something, uh, a ton of uh, uh, sellers from China emerged. And there's this accusation that these people are not making it themselves. They have their sweatshops. So then Etsy becomes just like any other place of selling, right? So these are the dynamics that, the contradictions that emerge from the, this kind of a, a West-centric space, which is individualized. You are the maker and you are the entrepreneur. But whereas in places like India and China, we have access to cultures of servitude. We have people who will do that for us, which is also problematizing the idea of, you know, is the designer really the maker, right? So or the, or where, how much does the weaver or the maker of the product themselves creatively contribute to the design? 
So these are all the issues that come out differently in different spaces. So just because some come, a product comes from the global south doesn't make it authentically made by the poor people or something like that. And it, 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 it is a middle person capitalizing on it. So you, you've described it very well. Also, I was curious, because you have these exhibits, you said, and people buy them. So what do they create, in a sense? What's the range of? You mean in the fiber markets? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, range of sweaters, uh, shawls, um, and even yarn. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, these DIY community uh, expos and markets, they feed the rest of us DIY enthusiasts. So, yeah. OK, so again, to contextualize it uh, to what's happening here, handmade products are very expensive here. Right. Um, so it's easier to go to the mall and buy something that's, of course, uh, yeah, one, machine made. Yeah, machine made because it's cheaper and we go to the mall and buy. Uh, tailoring is expensive expensive now. Tailors have, like, they demand anywhere between 1,000 and 1,200. And here I'm talking only about Hyderabad. I don't know how it works in Mumbai, Delhi, etc. So it's definitely cheaper to go to the mall and buy. So I'm wondering how it is in the U.S. Is it cheaper to buy in these malls or is it cheaper to buy at these exhibitions? Well, these uh, fiber expos are very, I mean, they're not quite like a tailor making your whole ensemble. So there, be, there will be one or two products. And yes, if they are expensive, they're, if you actually value them for the amount of effort. And there are debates around you know, uh, value of work, handwork as well, and even there. But it's, uh, if you're talking about custom made clothes, that would be crazy. I think that monetization aspect, but I yeah. think you'll... Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is a monetization aspect through the entrepreneurial ventures in different ways. Yes? Mike, Mike, Mike. No? Okay, that's fine. See, the problem is I have to wear it, you have to wear it. I'm going to come down since he's so nicely latched it to my back. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the hashtag spinners of Instagram? What has been your experience networking with other spinners? What well, are they doing? <laughs> that's as much as you want to, as, as little as you want to. And I think it can give, become pretty much a cool kids club. Uh, people know each other in different ways. Uh, so I'm, I don't as, have as much time as, uh, to participate as a serious hashtag spinner of Instagram. As, but they, they have these, um, they have um, knit alongs, spin alongs. Tour de Fleece, all these things that are basically community activities, attempts to bring people together to do things. And then swaps, you make something, you send it to somebody else. So a lot of that, that phenomenon is fairly huge. And I think a lot of us participate as much as we can and as much as otherwise. And there are some people who are heavily into it for a while and then drop out of it. So. Uh, but have you been able to sort of draw a parallel between where the person who runs the page comes from and uh, oh, the spinning the, culture uh, in that country? <laughs> um, actually, in terms of that, I haven't really investigated. Mm -hmm. But there are some star spinners, stuns, uh, some star knitters mm -hmm. that keep getting, uh, they have podcasts that we mm -hmm. listen to, mm -hmm. and so those are there, and people go there. But mm -hmm. in terms of where, I think, you know, people who are absorbed in the community, they probably know where they are, but it's, it's still, the phenomenon is still a very global north kind of thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry to be not more specific, but that's, I think it's very difficult to be specific because it's yeah. such a it's such a wide ranging community. Yeah, to pin it down, yes, that's yeah. true. 
And there's something that you said, um, the subaltern will satisfy our desire to go back to our ancestral aesthetics. Uh, of course, what is the subaltern for that person who is going back to spinning is also a different question. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't just have to do with his um, or her position in society, it also has to do with what he sees or she sees as society. Okay. And yeah. in that sense, you can't really compare the experience. No. The no. only thing that's tying you together is… No, absolutely that, not. And that's, that where we, we do, that's where we do lack the actual, um, actual input from, you know. I mean, just because I may have interviewed a couple of spinners who come from that space, mm -hmm. doesn't mean I have the absolute understanding. I think it's, it's impossible to have an that's, absolute That's exactly that impossibility, because subalternity is staged in, in digital spaces. Yes, exactly. Anyone? More questions? We have nine more minutes. Yes. Pass the mic on. Uh, Ma'am, can you tell us more about uh, this aspect of agency and how it came through from the interviews? Because I found it really interesting, uh, but uh, does it reflect from your interview and how these weavers or uh, knitters were expressing it? Like uh, in terms of Instagram or the social media they are using and uh, the agency, if they do feel it. And again, the, the getting back to Farrell's point, we're bracketing uh, particular groups of people when we talk about agency. The agency is in relation to the people directly using these tools um, in relation to, uh, a, like, you know, display and sharing, right? And nobody, in the sense, in that sense, going back to what Shobha was asking, no, none of these women are doing it because their mother-in-law told them to do it or because their mother told them to do it because, in order that she have a true soul. And a lot of them are doing, yes, they are following very specific patterns sometimes, or they're creating their own. It's still coming across, right? Um, so the expression of agency doesn't necessarily mean they're outside of structures of society. It just means that that expression, that mode, that it's just like we were talking about, quote, quote, empowerment yesterday, right? That moment is empowering. That doesn't mean you've, you've kicked, kicked away all other structures of oppression. So when they express agency through the act of spinning, which is different from uh, when somebody tells you to spin so that you can have Khadi for the market, right? That's a different phenomenon. When you express agency through spinning, then it's that moment that where, the, where your subjectivity is transformed into a moment of um, independence. That's all I meant. And uh, can you elaborate on the aspect of new media? Because it's, it's about the activity. Yeah. And on Instagram or on YouTube, if, if you are conducting DIY sessions or anything else, so how does it transfer in terms of new media? So it is your performance, how I look at it. It's, it's your performance or your portrait. But it's also your connection. That's what yeah. it is. Because so, I connect to you and we, we, it's, it's, it's a social network. It's a social media space. So it's about people. It's, it's from the domestic to the public, right? Like the digitally domestic uh, spaces I was talking about in relation to Indian, gendered Indian spaces, where women uh, who have uh, become isolated in their home space then reach out and connect. There is a similar kind of dynamic of connecting to 
like-minded people, forming communities. And that aspect is both empowering and it forms into different networks. So while there is the performative aspect that it's visually performative and it's there for us to look at, that in itself is not the main focus of that. You're performing to a network of people. I think everybody's tired. I kind of exhausted all of you. I should have brought my spindles. How many things can I carry in my luggage? <laughs> yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, going back to traditional weavers, the indigenous ones, so uh, I have noticed this very interesting trend using them for, uh, by the big fashion houses, maybe Fab India. So they constantly stress on social media the fact that their clothes are this expensive because it's made by indigenous traders and weavers. So it's, it's pretty amusing how much is it's like using their agency to sell their products, commercialize it. Well, there's some truth in that, in that if you want to pay them fair wages, then it has to be expensive. The question there is, which designer is paying fair wages? How can we verify that? We'll, can, we'll have more of those discussions on Monday. Yeah, we have, um, in terms of copying patterns and copyright and things like that, people stealing ideas, yeah, there are those. And then there's the whole phenomenon of the Chinese producers stealing all of this and then cut, undercutting the rates, right? Because it's not possible for a handmade something to be that cheap, is what their, their argument is. So these are all... I mean, discussions and perceptions. I have no actual evidence in the form of, oh, that, that seller was Chinese or otherwise, but it's a big discussion point there. A lot of people are dissatisfied with the fact that the IPO opened up and all these Chinese producers are on there selling some things for an impossibly cheap rate. I'm sure now they must be selling it in all sorts of places, right? So, but, but this is a conversation that I was referring to specifically with regard to Etsy.com. When you get a chance to get online, you can check it out, yeah. But uh, FAUX, uh, handcrafted things and actual handcrafted things, they get sold in various fora. Again, I'm be talking about some of this when I talk about digital subalternity again. I, and so, because this is going to continue both in tomorrow's talk and on Monday's talk, but I'm going to talk a little more about t happy objects tomorrow. And there'll be a little overlap, but it's just this unwieldy bunches of data that I've had to decide which section, which parts of it go into which kind of writing. So some of it went into, went into my cyberculture and subaltern book in certain ways. Um, some of it went into my online philanthropy book in certain ways. And a lot of it is waiting to, went into a couple of articles, but a lot of it is waiting to be written into other things. Meanwhile, as I said, I've given a lot of talks because uh, these also feed into definitions of care, right? A lot of people think that handcrafting is a, in these DIY handcrafting communities, it's about care, ethics of care. And of course, I always like to put a spoke in the wheel of these kinds of discourses and say, yes, care, ethics of care, but it's also the fact that 
care itself has become commodified as a value, right, monetized. Look at the service industries in a place like India. The, and, and, and so many young people who are finding jobs there, they have to be disciplined into a particular mode of caring. Um, and so, and look at uh, how caring works in, re uh, there are people who've written about caring in relation to uh, migrants. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of that as well as it comes up. May or may not come up in the next few talks, but you'll be in touch. I think I talked about my students' work on uh, Chinese doulas. Yeah. But again, we have the issue of w women's uh, knowledge is getting commodified for, for a particular class location of consumers. Uh, and, and then that, that kind of splits up the idea that anything you do is completely for women's agency. Women are not one thing. They're classed. They're casted. They're, you know, so they're raised. So in that sense, you know, you have to unpack context by context to think in terms of um, what, what each term means. You did get to 12.30 if we want to stop now, but if there's any more last questions since we started late. We usually go until 12.30, right? Okay, there'll be a lot to process, and I, I promise you tomorrow's talk is going to come back to some of these points. There's no way, I mean, this is what I engage. So whatever I sound, it might seem a bit repetitive, but you'll have different ways of thinking through them different visuals, different things that will kind of problematize or, or reveal problems. And I really enjoy kind of workshopping these with you guys. So thank you. You're going to have to take it off. Thank you.